I'm ready. Oh, I forgot. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> we are now recording. Great. Okay. So I'm going to recommend folks that um, you don't need to see the people. It's a lot of people. And um, in this short presentation that I'm going to do, you can turn your screen off, close the people. I'm not looking at anybody right now. So um, here's the guiding question that I, I really want us to think about as we look at this text. And that is what's best for students. Really important. Uh, the way that we've set up this uh, webinar today is we're going to I'm going to give you a chapter one preview, and so that'll be my presentation. Then we're going to put you into breakout discussion groups where you'll be able to participate. And then we'll look at chapter two. Again, that'll be my presentation. And then uh, a breakout discussion group again with possibly some time for questions at the end. Um, if you didn't read the chapters, that's great because this is really a preview before you go ahead and read them, hopefully over the next week. A couple of agreements I'd like us to make. I'm going to try to keep my presentation parts down to 10 minutes or less. I ask that you mute. I think everybody is muted. And again, remind you, please take your videos off. You don't need them on right now. Then you can actually move any way you want while I'm talking. And there will be time for discussion in the discussion groups, but be prepared to participate and um, think and share there. But if you do have questions while I'm presenting, throw those in thoughts, questions, and epiphanies in the chat box. So looking at chapter one, grading for equity, um, he starts off by talking and teaching us about um, how grading is connected to our identities as teachers. Uh, and he talks about this thing he calls the island of autonomy. And, and he says that grades are the only thing that some teachers feel they have control over thanks to unions and state policies. And we don't always feel we have control of our curriculum and the school. Uh, rules and the school expectations, but we do have control of our grades because there have been laws and unions have fought for the fact that no one can change our grades. Uh, but it's important to note that um, every teacher makes different, very different choices based on their own lens. He says, because each teacher's grading system is virtually unregulated and unconstrained, a teacher's grading policies and practices reveal how she defines and envisions her relationship with students. What she predicts best prepares them for success, her beliefs about students and her self-concepts as a teacher. So we each bring that lens to our grading. And then he talks about grading and our web of belief, which is an idea from philosopher W.B. Quine in 1978, who said that our beliefs are a complex system of what we hold to be true in the world based on our experiences and prior understanding. And so we as teachers bring our experiences and our understanding to our grading. And it made me think a little bit last summer, we had the pleasure of watching a spider and her web outside our kitchen window all summer long. And that web, she would build it and it was beautiful. And then she'd catch some insects and then it was torn apart like the one in the photo here. And then she would rebuild it and try to recreate it the way that it was. And that's what we do as teachers oftentimes is, you know, we originally um, built our web based on perhaps our mentor teachers or our own experience being graded in high school. As we went into teaching, we created the way we graded. Maybe we learned from some colleagues and we built that our grading system, our grading practices on our own web of belief from our foundations of that web to uh, our experiences as we moved through teaching. Uh, as he continues in chapter one, he talks about how this book as a whole is divided up, kind of split up, where he wants to blend the technical and the theoretical. So that would be the how of our grading practices, as well as the why. Like, what's the why behind our practices? And I think so often we don't slow down enough to think about why we do things. We just do them because we've been doing them for a really long time. So the technical part of it, what he's hoping to provide us with the, these more equitable practices in the book is um, ideas of how to implement changes that are required for time and for messaging and assessment design and gradebook software. He shares successful and concrete examples and struggles and successes of teachers who tried, to, tried some of these things out. On the theoretical end of it, he was hoping to give us um, some grading purpose and also to recognize some inequities um, based on the evolution of grading. He 
provide some history of grading as well as current research-based knowledge uh, and really tries to get us to think about the messages that our grading gives to our students, to our stakeholders like parents and administration. Um, and he tries to provide us with actual equitable practices, practices that can improve our assessments and our curriculum design and our instructional decisions. So it goes just beyond, it goes beyond our grading and our grading practices. So the book as a whole, he talks about this in chapter one, about how he organized it. He starts with part one, foundations, uh, where he talks about grading identity and history, which is what we're looking at today. And then in part two, he calls it the case for change, where he shows current practices that teachers are doing and the inequities that um, occur because of that. And he provides a proposal for more equitable grading. And the end part, which is my favorite part, which I was the kind of reader that's like, I need the answers. And so I started to read this, I read the preview, and then I went to part three, immediately looking at some of the specific practices I was most interested in. And so he actually shares some tangible things that we, we can do as teachers. So the way we designed this whole book study for this group is we're looking at chapters one and two today, and we're kind of previewing and, and doing some thinking. We're gonna ask you to read one and two over the next week if you have the book. If you don't, you'll still be okay. Uh, and then in part two, we're gonna, the case for change on the ninth, we'll look at chapter three. Uh, I'll preview it and then you read chapter three after. On the 16th, we'll look at chapter four together and then you read it after. And then on the 23rd, we'll do chapters five and six. So all of that case for change, we'll look at that theory, the why, and talk about ideas together. And then part three, the practices, I really felt like it was important that people had some options of what practices they were most interested in. So what we decided to do is in July, we'll let you choose the practices you would like to look at. They're kind of categorized. Um, and then you'll, we'll put you into work groups and those groups can decide if they, what, what, how much time they want to read that section of those practices, when they want to meet, if they want to meet once or twice or three times in July, it's really up to each group. And then we would come back as this large group in August and have folks kind of report out what the groups were looking at. So as a whole, what uh, Joe Feldman hopes to share with us are more equitable grading practices. And the, this is kind of the series of ideas that he wants us to really think about what he wants us to consider moving into our grading practices. Uh, things that are accurate and mathematically sound, grading that supports hope and a growth, growth mindset, lifting the veil on how to succeed, building soft skills and motivating students, and valuing knowledge, not environment or behavior. And then a final word in chapter one that he shared that I thought was important. Um, he talks about envisioning the possibility. So as we move forward into this book, he says, as we, as we learn new ideas, let us be open, humble, honest, and forgive ourselves if we weren't aware that things could be different. And I found for myself, as I was reading this book, uh, that I felt bad <laughs> for some of the things I had done in my previous teacher life. Practices that I did that I thought were right, that other teachers taught me were right, that I didn't realize weren't equitable and actually might have harmed some kids. But what's really important is that I was willing to think about how to improve that now, to be open, and also to forgive myself and move on. I did the best that I could do with the knowledge that I had at that time. And I've been teaching a long time and we've learned so much about learning and teaching that we can learn to do things differently now. So at this point, we're gonna kind of start to shift to, into the breakout groups. And I want us to think about how do we make that successful? Because uh, I, think we're gonna, I think Morgan is gonna put like five or six people in a group and we're going to give you a limited time to be together. So when you are placed into these groups with our discussion question, if one, person would take on the role of facilitator very quickly to say, I'll be the facilitator. And that facilitator, your job is to call on people. So you can look at the screen and so we can move from one person to the next person and time um, isn't stolen or, or wasted by oh, who's going to talk next. And then also if we could have a second person take on the role of timekeeper. So by the beginning, one person be facilitator, one person be timekeeper. And the, the timekeeper, when we go into our group, if you could time people, they have about a minute to share. So the timekeeper, give them like a 15 second warning after they've been talking for 30, 45, give them a little warning so that they can close up. And when you've been given that warning and when that timekeeper shares so kindly that your time is up, if you could actually 
let go. Whatever it is you felt you needed to say, it's okay. And let's move to the next person so that all the people get a chance to share. And then finally, engagement. That not only do you engage as a person who shares, but that you really listen to what other people are sharing as well. So I would like um, to suggest at this time that you turn on your cameras because when you're in the small groups, you'll, you'll want to be seeing each other. So please yep. do turn on your cameras. Um, and I did post the questions in the box as well. Um, and so now I am going to, um, let's see, I'm going to open all the rooms. Good work. Nope, I'm going to close those. Okay. Never mind. All right, there we go. Now I'm going to open all the rooms. Okay. There we go. Hmm. I don't know why I didn't get Carrie in there, but okay. I need to improve my practice. So that's what brings me here. And um, also there's a lot of inconsistency um, in the department, in the school. So I'm hoping I can share what I learned here with other people. That's it. Great, next in my window is Melissa. Thank you for sharing, Margaret. Hi, my experience is uh, much the same as Margaret's, but I've been at this school uh, I really, I always struggle when it's time to grade things. Like it's this, it, it like, it's the worst part I think of teaching. I really struggle to find, it, does this represent what my students really know? Um, and we have a big pushback from admin to pass people. Like they, they you know, they,
So we'll just take a few minutes for everybody to come back in. Well, looks like Patty's back. There we go. So one of the things I should have mentioned is that um, it helps if you note your breakout room number. <laughs> that way, Patty can call on, on someone and say, hey, did anybody from breakout room four want to report out or something? And I forgot to mention that. <laughs> Sorry, I'll remind you next time. All right, Patty, we're all back. Patty, I believe you're muted. Yeah, Patty, we can't we can't hear you. You need to unmute yourself. Might want, yeah. No. Nope. Oh man, you guys missed some good stuff. I wow. said some I... profound things while I was muted. So <laughs> let me start again. So chapter two is about a brief history of grading. I didn't really say anything good, don't worry. Uh, but anyhow, so I don't know about some of you, but this reminds me of report cards when I was little. Uh, they were handwritten and yellowed. Uh, in chapter two, he presents these different things that happened um, over the course of the last hundred years or so in the U.S. that really seemed to influence education as well, in particular rating. So he talks about the rise of manufacturing, progressive educators, migration and immigration, intelligence testing and categorization, and behaviorism. Uh, the, with the rise of manufacturing, it was all about efficiency and productivity, and there was this pressure to create future employees, people that could work well at these factories, and certain industry characteristics were used as models for our public schools. There was a, Feldman writes, there was a cultural veneration for the power and productivity of factories, which persuaded policymakers to incorporate characteristics of industry, specialization, chain of command, timed routines, and efficiencies into public institutions, including schools. And then progressive educators like John Dewey, it was all about um, universal education, open to all, and we should have common curriculum. There should be, we should elevate the social and economic positions and support moral development. And so that also influenced education. In the end, although Dewey's vision of schools as democratic engine provided overarching rhetoric about schools. It was often eclipsed by the vision of schools as training ground. So these were conflicting things, what was happening with industry and manufacturing and factories to, versus what schools educators actually wanted to do. Sounds like a common theme. Uh, and then there was migration and immigration and, and people were moving from rural living to cities to work at those factory jobs. Transportation was better, so people were able to move more. And there was a massive wave of immigrants from Western and then Eastern Europe during the 1900s. Well, in 19, 1820, there were only four US cities of populations over 25,000 people. Four decades later, there were 35 cities that had populations of over 25,000 with nine cities of over 100,000. So clearly the radical changes in the student population couldn't help but profoundly affect schools. And then there was intelligence testing and categorization. The natural intelligence theory is like, is it nature or nurture that makes people smart? And there were scientists studying school size to see if they could determine what size school would have the best brains. And then there were IQ tests that were developed that were believed to assess your intellectual character and disposition. And all of these things really helped just justify racist beliefs. Higher scores among white, wealthy Protestants and lower scores among immigrant groups and African Americans were used both to affirm the idea of the United States as a meritocracy and to reinforce the validity of the existing hierarchy. 
and then behaviorism in the um first it was pavlov's dog and then bf skinner who was doing the rat experiments where he determined that if he gave a certain stimulant the rat would do a certain action and they somehow translated these animal experiments to humans and decided that human behavior could be the result of external stimuli this theory of learning that humans could be taught to act in certain ways through extrinsic reinforcement or consequences became wildly popular in schools and factories. So how do all these things actually change schools? All the five that we were just talking about. Well, in the 19th century, it was more about obedience. Well, kids needed to be well behaved. They were in that one room schoolhouse. And the teacher, because it was so small, there was a lot of familiarity with the teachers. And so as far as grading is concerned, they were able to report to families whether their kids were well behaved or not in school and they would either share those aloud or they would um, write a narrative about them and then in the ninth early, late 19th century early 20th century was assimilation we had a lot of immigrants we needed to train to be americans and native american children were placed in boarding schools and were actually trained to be white trained not to be the indians that they were used to train to lose their culture um, and grading in that respect these kids either passed or failed and for some of them it was fatal both some many died and it's for some they um they lost their culture because we trained it out of them and just a little detour um in around the same time period in the early 19th century the idea of an average man uh started to come about and this affects the way we think about grading today a Belgian mathematician, Adolf Quetlet, um, he did some research on so, on human behavior, and he decided and he decided what was average, and that average is perfect. The perfect perfect person is average. And then he had a sociologist um, mentee named Francis Galton who wanted to show that the um, elites were better, and so he used the same idea of averaging, but decided that there was above average and below average and average is not perfect above average is and that's what we use today he actually came up with classes like imbeciles and mediocre and the eminent and that's not in the book but i've been doing some research on it um so back to this book um in 20th century sorting and ranking um happened a lot mainly because schools were larger there were so many more kids in school teachers had bigger uh, teacher student ratios and there, there was this need to, for efficiency and accountability so single letter grades a through f came in norm reference grades with using that average um the bell curve just another little detour about letter grades so i learned that william farish a cambridge university tutor uh, he wanted to process more students in less time to make more money so he created a letter grade system based on what they did in the shoe factory industry to label if shoes were up to grade or not. And then later um, here in the United States, it was actually 1887, the Mount Holyoke College used letter grades and then high schools followed suit in the 1900s. And interestingly, there was originally an E, which I didn't know, but the E was actually taken out because they didn't want anybody to be confused that your E meaning failure could possibly be E meaning excellent. So that's why there's no E in the grading scale. Another detour that's not in the book. Back to the book. In the 20th century, Bellman shares about tracking and how IQ tests were used in schools to determine who should be on a work track and who should be on a college track and also to separate um, based on socioeconomics and racial hierarchies. And then today, early we had obedience, today we still have compliance grades show that you're compliant. Assimilation, we still have grades that reflect that kids could be good citizens. We still sort and rank and we use the bell curve and we still track kids into vocational ed or college. So that's the quick overview of the brief history from his book with a little extras. Uh, and we're gonna actually shift again into discussion groups. And I think Morgan is also putting this in the, um, in the chat section. So when you go in the groups, you have that. So how do you see the ideas and beliefs of the early 20th century manifesting themselves through your schools? And there's several possibilities here. You could choose one or answer more than one through the art school's communication, curriculum, instruction, policies, and or grading. So how do these past beliefs still show up today?
that's what we want you to address in your discussion groups. So um, I will send you off to your rooms again. I've got the timer set for six minutes, so roughly a, a minute per person. And you will get a one minute warning. You don't actually have to um, manually come back. You will automatically be sent back if you want to take advantage of every minute of talk. So here you go. I'm going to send you off into your rooms. sister is a teacher so it's as close to a family